I would love for you to return with me for just a minute to 1992. You remember it? Some of you were not yet. Some of you remember it really well. This was back before mobile phones. This is when we used a landline, a real landline, not the VOIP thing, a real copper one to dial into digital bulletin boards. It was early. No such thing as Mosaic or Netscape or Firefox or Explorer or Safari or Chrome. Wendy, my wife, and I, our youth pastor who was teaching us, uh, and a group of students went on a journey to the Amazon. Uh, not that Amazon. That Amazon <laughs> didn't exist yet either in 1992. But this Amazon. And we had a crisis. We adapted to this river. We learned very quickly that that's not the Amazon. That's just a little tributary. The real one is much much bigger, and there were no roads out, and there were no ways home. You got there either by boat or by float plane, and we couldn't just go grab one of those and go back to Tennessee. We were stuck, but we adapted to that, and we adapted to the mud. There was lots and lots of mud in the rainforest. We didn't think about that, but we learned quickly that flip-flops were better than boots. Adapted to the humidity. We learned that it's okay to have mold on your shoes in the morning. And you'll be okay. We adapted to the lack of showers, learned quickly that the Amazon was a perfectly good place to bathe. You just don't want to bleed. As long as you don't bleed, the piranha won't bite you. And we adapted to the alligators. We adapted to not flushing. There was even a little song they taught us about when to flush the toilet and when to not. And maybe you've heard it if you've been in a country without sewers, or at least in that part of the country. We adapted to everything until, until. We were doing really good until the washing machine broke. <laughs> and then we had a crisis. Then we panicked. Most of our team had only packed for a few days. We knew it was gonna be a warm climate. We wouldn't need much, but we had planned to wash our clothing. And we had tried to anticipate a tropical rainforest and we didn't anticipate the mud and we needed to wash our clothing and now with no washing machine how on earth were we possibly going to wash our clothes now I know what some of you are thinking don't jump ahead it took us a few minutes and then we thought of it too but it was 1992 I was 22 years old and I was in that weird place in life where I was in between being a student and now being an adult you relate to that I had responsibility but I wasn't always sure I was an adult yet. Some of you are 75 and you're thinking, yeah, I was an adult. And then they started telling me when I'm allowed to eat. And when some of you are younger and you're in that, that 24 year old range is really weird because you, you are, but you're still saying yes, sir, no, sir, and mister. And, and it's strange. I wasn't sure I was an adult yet. There's a new word in our culture. It's been around for a few years now for that strange thing in life where you have to act like a grown-up even if you don't like it or you're not especially good at it. You know this word? I get said head nods. We call it adulting now. We took adult and use it like a verb to describe doing adultness, being adult. To adult is to act maturely, and we don't always like it. We have to act like a grown-up. We were in the Amazon, and our washing machine had broken, and it took us a minute. We needed to adult now. And uh, someone said, and I think it was me. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm going to take credit for it. Someone said, um, you can use the sink like people always have done, you know, with your hands and water. And soap, and we felt really silly then, because of course we could wash our clothes without a machine. They've always, we've been doing that for centuries. But hey, we weren't all adults yet, and it took a minute to adapt. Do you think of yourself as an adult? When things go wrong, do you identify? Do you, do you consider yourself mature? How do you think of yourself? Do you ever think about yourself and think, how do I define myself and who I am and where I are, where I am right now, <laughs> where I are? It is a, it's an important question. There was a theologian named A.W. Tozer who wrote a book called uh, The Knowledge of the Holy. And in the 
first page, he says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us, because Tozer's argument is that that's how we begin to define ourselves, and if we have a clear picture of God, then everything else starts to make sense, and when we struggle with that, we'll struggle with other things. I think the Apostle Paul probably agreed with Tozer, or maybe that's the other way around, probably. In this letter that we're going to be in for a number of weeks called Titus, Paul's going to define himself at the very beginning of the letter, and I think it's going to help us. If you've got a Bible, flip it open, open it, launch it, whatever you do, get to the book of Titus. You'll get to the New Testament, the part that, about the coming of Jesus, and you get through a few of those first books, and there'll be a series of short books, some of them with names or places, ones and twos, and then Titus is in that list. And uh, it's the Apostle Paul writing to a young leader named Titus, and he's going to show us what it looks like to adult, to grow into maturity, to become mature. The whole book is going to kind of paint that picture, and we'll break that down into little pieces as we go through. And here in the very beginning of it, in the first couple of verses, Paul will start by defining himself, and I think that'll help us define us. I warn you, part of it's going to be a little heavy. We'll talk a lot in this room about your identity in Christ and what God has done for us and this new life we have and the excitement of that. But now and then there'll be words in the Bible that you go, wow, that's a heavier word. I don't know if I've thought about myself that way before or that word makes me uncomfortable in the culture right now. But I think you'll be encouraged at the end. So let's read it. We're going to Titus chapter one, first four verses. It goes like this. Paul a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life which God who never lies promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I've been entrusted by the command of God our Savior to Titus my true child and a common faith Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. One of the ways we know the Apostle Paul was a preacher is because that's one sentence. <laughs> it's one sentence, the whole long idea. Do you remember the last time you wrote a letter and you took time to introduce yourself at the front of the letter? We lost something there, didn't we? Remember when you set it up? If you ever did, did you set it up kind of like Paul did? He goes through a handful of really important steps. I'll show you in a minute. He induces himself. Uh, uh, he knows that it's going to Titus, but the assumption was this was going to be shared with some of the other leaders and some of the other churches in the same region. And so there's an intro there. I've got a letter written to my great, great, great grandmother in 1864, and it was written like this. He takes a second to introduce. Dear sister, I embrace the opportunity to drop you a few lines to let you know where and how I have been since I saw you. We left Stonebridge and came to Nashville and stayed there till the 31st of August when we drew some horses and started after Wheeler, armed with infilled rifles. He keeps going and he explains what happened. We lost something, didn't we? Do you write like that anymore? Dear sister, it's been a few moments since I've had a chance to explain and to, we, we lost something. Was it etiquette? Time? We feel pinched on time. I've had people remind me, say hi to me before you ask for stuff, Steve. I think that's a good reminder. Just say, hi. Hey, have you got that thing? Um, <laughs> manners and etiquette. Maybe we lost more than that. Maybe we lost some of ourselves. Culturally, we don't think about the importance of, let's take a time Take a moment at the beginning to introduce, to just establish who we are and where we are and why we're writing. Paul does all that in the beginning. Uh, he starts in four verses, and it, we went quick, but he begins with who he is. And then he describes what he is for, and not like Rams or Patriots, but his purpose, what he's for, and then why he's writing why he's writing. How do you do that? When you think about yourself, how do you set up your letter, the intro to your life? This is who I am and what I'm for. In verse one, Paul starts like this. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. There was this custom 
in um, Greek cities around this area where Paul is writing to, and it would have been common, most people would have known about it. Uh, slavery was common in the world at that time, but operated differently than what many of us know in the history of this country. There, a slave could gain their own freedom. There were processes to get out of it, and one of the things you could do was raise money, and as you raised money, you could take it to a temple of whatever uh, pagan deity you worshiped, and you could deposit money at that temple. And when you had enough money ready, you would go there with your owner, with the master to the temple, and the owner would ask that the God of the temple buy the slave from him. And so your freedom would be purchased with the money you had saved, given to the temple, and then they could say the God had bought you for himself and freed you. There was a custom. People would have known that. It happened around that time. There's some good historical documenting that Paul is using some of this language. But the difference for us is the Bible will teach that we were all slaves, not just some of us. And either to sin, which is everybody, or to the law, which that's a subset of some who were slaves to the law, or to false gods, which is another subset. And the other difference is that our God really did pay for us himself. I didn't save up money and put it on deposit with God. I didn't have any. Jesus paid for me himself to free me, to have him for himself, to free me into who he actually made me to be. And Paul adopts part of that language and uses it here in your Bible. The Greek word doulos, we translate it in English servant, and I don't know why. If you look it up in Greek dictionaries, there's even some notes that say uh, in early American writing and in English, they've leaned toward this word servant. The real word there is slave. It's slave. And I don't know if English speakers do that out of shame or denial. I don't know where that started, but the word slave. Paul will usually introduce himself as slave of Jesus. Here it's um, of God. Paul saw himself as an owned man. The property of the one who had redeemed him, had rescued him, who had paid for him with his own life, the one who had bought him. Paul saw himself as being owned by God, by Jesus. It wasn't just made by him. He had been bought by him. And that's all over your Bible, isn't it? You start looking for it, you get in the New Testament, you are not your own, you were bought with a price. We use words like ransom, redeemed, it's all this language, it's financial. We were purchased. The purchase price for your soul was Jesus. And he paid it himself willingly. Paul describes himself like that. Do you think about that in your life? Who owns you? Like, who really is your master? So he said, I'm the master of my own ship, Steve. And I think, really? Are you? Because the Bible says that you can't even make yourself taller. But you'll tell me you're in charge of your destiny. I would argue that you're not the master of yourself like maybe you think you are. That something else has you whether you realize it or not. Paul had been his own master, he thought. He was climbing the ladder. He was doing really well as a scholar, a scribe. He had zeal for God. He was so excited for God when there was this new sect of people rising up saying that Jesus is God. Paul would hunt them down, arrest them, and make sure they got what they needed to be executed for it. He was good at it. And so when he met Jesus personally, it wrecked him. And he gave everything to Jesus, his whole self. He knew it Jesus bought Paul. He redeemed him. And here's the challenge. If you're a believer in Christ, he bought you too. Bought you. It's hard, isn't it? We don't use the words like that. This is America. It's 2019. We don't struggle with terms like that. This is what our Bible tells us. When my kids were little, I took them to this movie. Uh, It was the story about this really insecure man He was unsure of his own identity. He felt really threatened by other people. And um, in the course of the movie, there was this moment of fear and panic, and he shoved his rival out a window. He thinks that will set things right and secure his own place, and it doesn't. 
And then he spends the rest of the movie trying to repair his sin, trying to fix it. In the end, only one thing saves it. Only one thing saves him. It's the love of his master. There was one person who loved him, one person who owned him, a little boy who wrote his name on his foot. You remember this movie? Some of you don't. I have a visual aid that might help. Where are you, Sheriff Woody? Remember Toy Story? It's a kid's movie. It set everything right when he finally knew whose he was. There's a whole second movie where he gets confused because it gets painted over and it takes the whole movie to remember whose he was. Which is what happens to us, isn't it? You get your identity set. You come into Christ and realize I'm his. He wanted me for himself. He's freed me. He's helped me step into what he created me to be. And then we lose track of it. And stuff gets painted over your foot. And before you know it, there's other things on there. What's on your foot right now? Is it clear and loud and clear that I belong to Jesus? Or have things crept in and gotten in the way of that? Maybe you've forgotten. Maybe you find yourself serving other things beside him. Now, this isn't just a list of all the stuff that tempts you. I don't have room on my foot for all those things that I stumble into. But sometimes I find that my whole identity has gotten clouded and I'm obeying something else and it's controlling me. And I don't have to live that way. But it's great now and then to go through and see what's on my foot right now. Is it clear or has it gotten cloudy and blurred? Is, are there things like money on there? I love Jesus. I know who owns me, but if you actually looked at my banking account, I might say, what would it say? What's your actual priority? Could be your anger. You're so deeply wounded. Or there's some old thing you're just unable to forgive and you find that's actually controlling your life. That's what owns you right now. You, you were born again, made new, bought by the blood of Jesus, but the reality is you're struggling with all this other stuff and it controls you or fear and worry. I'm secure in my identity in Jesus, but I'm so scared and so worried about what people will think. You get stuck there sometimes. It's easy, isn't it? Or is it your friends? You use pressure from them. You think about how far have you gone to be liked by the gals? Or what have you done to be accepted by your bros? Tacos? Your appetite is the thing that clouds your identity in Christ. Whatever your appetite is, for some of you it's food. For others it's other things. Power, sex, some substance that you just gotta have. Or if you've been able lately to rub away the distractions and know who you are and whose you are, the one who paid for your sin, the one who redeemed you, bought you. This isn't just about who you serve, by the way. You don't think about this just in terms of him as a master. This is about identity. I belong to Jesus. Try that on sometime. You can say it in front of the mirror. I want to challenge you to say it right now, out loud. You ready? You're going to say, I belong to Jesus. One, two, three. I belong to Jesus. Let that sink in. Find ways to get that in front of you in the morning or in the evening. Put it in your email signature. You just put it in there. Redeemed by Jesus. That's kind of bold. Some of you are at places where you're not allowed to do that. Uh, some of you may get more bold in your email. Emails are things adult use, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> um, maybe you write in there property of Jesus Christ. We're paid in full. First thing Paul establishes, he establishes who he is in terms of whose he is. That's what sets everything else right. We define ourselves by whose we are. You're not your own, you were bought at a price. And he's not done, he keeps going. Still in verse one, an apostle of Jesus Christ, apostolos in Greece, in Greek, it just means messenger or envoy, except it was a really special group of people and I'm not one. I think I'm getting comfortable saying I'm a slave of Jesus. I can say doulos, servant, those are easy. The slave word, it's a heavy word, isn't it? 
But apostle, I'm not one, and neither are you. There were 17 of them, maybe 18. We're not exactly sure, but they're all dead. They had a very special role and purpose. They were eyewitnesses of the risen, walking Jesus. I'm not one of those. In Acts chapter 14, there's a list of them, and it includes, it includes Paul and Barnabas. So we got the 12, one of those uh, died, they added another one, and now Paul and Barnabas were at 14. And then the later letters will add uh, James, Andronicus, Junius, maybe Silas, and not real sure what to do with Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. It's a limited set of direct witnesses. They saw Jesus and were commissioned by him. You can think about the apostles as the scripture writers. These are the ones the Holy Spirit initially used to write the scriptures for us now. They were messengers. There's no mas apostolas. It's your Spanish for the day. You look that up. This is who Paul is. It starts with whose he is, and he's beginning to transition into what he's for. He's a messenger of Jesus. And he's a messenger of Jesus for a purpose. He's a messenger for the sake of the faith of God's elect. That's God's chosen, the people who are going to be saved, us, us, and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. And I think the clause ties together. This modifies that. It's the knowledge of truth. What kind of truth? The kind of truth that accords with godliness. Godliness means piety or devotion. It's the kind of truth that explains how to live in God. What's Paul for? Paul is for faith for God's people and knowledge of the truth that explains how to live. That's what he's for. And he tells this to Timothy in the first two verses. This is the first 10, 15 words of the letter. That's not all that he's for. But it's all that he's going to explain here, although there's going to be one more, for your faith and for our knowledge of the truth, the truth that shows us how to live. You want to know how to live? Read the letters of Paul. That's what he was for. It's why we have those letters in the New Testament, things like Romans and Corinthians. They explain, what's this now mean that I'm in Christ, I'm a new creation? What do I do with that? Get into Galatians and it'll mess with your head. He explains it. There's one more. In hope of eternal life. He's for these things built on the hope of eternal life. The preposition in here is kind of strange in English. In the Greek, it, it, it's epi. It should be on or upon. So it's those things built upon the hope of eternal life. Uh, it's a further description, I think, of Paul's purpose. Some think it, it's a description of the faith. I think this is part of his purpose. I'm for those three things. He's telling this at the beginning of the letter. It's on the hope of eternal life, for your faith and the knowledge of truth, built upon the hope of eternal life. And he's not done because he's going to describe this eternal life that everything he's about is built upon. All that I'm about is built upon this. I belong to Jesus. I'm his slave and I'm his messenger. I'm built upon this eternal life. The eternal life, which God, who never lies, because remember, Paul's for truth, and it's God who is truth now, promised before the ages began. God promised this eternal life, and he did it before time began. The Greek word in there is beautiful. It is, uh, there's two words, chronon, which we get chronos, and ionion, eon, or uh, eternity. So it's before time eternal, in eternal time, God promised before time begin. Before he made time, he promised this. Before we knew about it, God planned this, that we could be bought by Jesus and be restored to live with him forever, our maker. The eternal life that God promised and at the proper time manifested, made it happen. God promised it, and when he was ready, he did it. He revealed it. He made it happen. He made it happen in his word. It's literally uh, God manifested the word in his time, which we think the word's Jesus, right? God promised it, and when he was ready, he manifested it in Jesus. He made it happen when he was ready. That's the eternal life that Paul's standing upon. Now think about this. This is the introduction to the letter. I, Paul, slave of God and messenger of Christ for your faith and knowledge of truth on the hope of eternal life, which the God of truth promised before time and manifested in his time through the preaching, which I was commanded to preach by God. Hey, Titus, what's up? It's just the intro. It's just his hello. It's like, shalom, little buddy. Grace and peace 
from God and Jesus to you. It's just the intro. It told who Paul is. It told what he's for. And he tells him why he's writing. We'll talk more about it next week. But he tells him grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. And by the way, you can watch Paul do this if you look at some of his letters. He'll blur the line between Jesus and God pretty consistently because Jesus is God. We have one God, three persons, Father, Son, Spirit. And Paul will do that in his writing. Sometimes he's the slave of God. Sometimes he's the slave of Christ. Sometimes it's God our Savior. Sometimes it's Christ our Savior. He'll blur that. It's heavy, you can relax. Paul is for your faith, that's what he's for. He's for your faith and knowledge of truth on the hope of eternal life that God promised and now made manifest in Jesus, which Paul has been commanded to preach. That's what he's for. This whole thing, he's been commanded to tell that story now. What are you for? Can you do it in a long sentence in three verses? a question you should ask now and then. Not what are humans for? What's it mean to be human and in the image of God and to glorify him, to love him, know him? What are you for? You. The, The way you were built and made. The experiences that you've had, good and bad. Where you were born. What color your skin is. What languages you speak. Your talents. The way the Holy Spirit has gifted And wired you, what's it for? What's it for? Do you ever ask that? When I was a young youth pastor, we went to young youth pastor training, and they made us wrestle through this question, gave us this little Bible study to help us kind of figure this out and identify it and write what they called your personal vision statement, personal mission statement. What are you for? And that exists for you no matter where you're employed or what you do or where you live. This is you as a child of the king, redeemed through the blood of Christ, here's what you're for. Now, use that in your career, in the world, or whatever. And I used to have one that was really, really clear for me. It guided me as a young youth pastor for years. I exist to, and it had to like alliterate. You didn't have to, but I felt the need. I, had to, I exist to enlist, equip, and empower student disciple makers for life. I'd modified it over time, that others to disciple students and young people and to do that in a lifelong pattern that those relationships would extend out. That guided me a really, really, really long time. And then one day my role changed and my job changed and I started working with young adults and then I started working on our teaching team and then eventually I became a lead pastor and I'd never rewritten my purpose statement. And I was part of a church that needed to restart. We were starting over. We had to rewrite all the words. What's the mission and vision of that? Place And because I no longer knew what I was for, I got tangled up in the mission of the church. And so what it was for, I was for. We kind of became the same thing. That made me really controlling of every word we used and really nervous about getting all that right because I couldn't separate my mission from his church. Some of you have been there. You struggle with it. Those of you out in the marketplace, you built something or you climb something, you, you put in all the years, and then over time, you became it. And then one day, you got everything you wanted, and you looked around, and you'd lost your family, or lost your health, or realized you spent everything on your company, and you didn't mean to do that. Some of you parents, you were so excited to have kids, you spent everything, you, you poured out your life raising them and getting them ready, making them safe, and now they're teens, and they're starting to challenge your plan. And it's devastating sometimes. You're finding yourself fighting the child that that you give anything for. And you're angry and discouraged. Part of that happens because you don't know what you're for. Your role isn't just to keep them safe, clean, and schooled. You were set there to make little adults. You're trying to create adults and then point them toward Jesus. But if you've never defined that and sat down and backed up, wait, what am I for? As a human, what am I for? Then you get lost in that and it gets really discouraging. Some of you young adults, you 13, 17, 20 some years of school for a degree and a job, but you're not sure what you're for. Because you are not, now let this sink in, you're not a nurse or a doctor or a lawyer or a mechanic or a landscaper or a a professional golfer. (laughs) 
That's what you do. That's what you've trained to do. That's a set of skills you have. It's how you pay the bills or where you serve and use your skills. But you are a son or a daughter of the king redeemed by Jesus Christ, placed in those places to be used by him to you fill in the blank. You gotta wrestle with what's in your blank. What are you for as his child? And then you step into how you use that in whatever career or whatever place you find yourself from an ER to walking on the beach grabbing seashells. Maybe your, your blank says something about in my redeemed status as a child of God, I'm for encouraging hurting people. And God uses that in this career or this profession or this workplace. Or maybe it's I create jobs so people can build lives. Or I bring prayer into people's daily lives so they know that God loves them. Or I help addicts recover. Or I'm light in the marketplace where there's hope and truth where people don't have it. Or maybe I, I love abandoned children or abandoned adults. I don't know. You and the Holy Spirit have got to wrestle with that and figure that out. If you need help... I've got the Bible study that helped me, um, and this was a horrible plan, so bear with me, but this is my plan. I've got some paper ones, and I've got a list where you can write your email address, and I'll send you a PDF later um, this week, or you can just email me, and I'll send it to you that way. I'm Steve at riversidechurch.org. Um, that'll be here at the end, and I'll send that to you. It walks through a couple of other people in the Bible to look at all their experiences and who they were, and then how God used that. And it pushes you in to look at your own life and to start to wrestle with, okay, what am I for? Not just what am I good at and where do I serve, who am I? It's handy. I'm working on mine now. I've got half of it rewritten. So I know the first part and now I'm, I'm figuring out the other part. So if you take me to coffee, we'll compare notes sometimes. What I do know is this. We define ourselves by whose we are. That's where Paul starts. Letter after letter of your Bible in the New Testament will start with this. There's a statement of who first, and it's always in terms of whose we are. That's a shift in your thinking. It will affect your relationships. You just think about people you're thinking about dating. I can't marry someone who belongs to a different Lord. That simplifies things, doesn't it? The Bible talks about that. That's why. You, you're owned by Jesus. How could you marry or bind your life to someone who's not? How do you think that's going to work? It'll affect your finances. You start to think, I don't actually own anything. I died. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. This, word, this language is all over your Bible. And you start to realize, I'm just a steward now. It's all his. All of it. And so the question changes. It's not how much should I give. It's, hey, God, how much do you want me to live on? It's all yours. What do you want to do with it? And how do you want to use me to steward it? changes the way we think. We start with our identity in him and then it, we ask a different set of questions. It'll affect your job, your retirement. It'll affect school. You step into place and think, God has me in assignment in this place for now. And he's gifted me like this and he's given me this burden. So, okay, God, how do you want to use me here? Now. I don't have a tattoo right now, but if I was getting one, Here's something to consider. Um, I'm just gonna start with my foot, and I think I can bend it and not fall over. Nope, I can't. Roby, you may have to help me. There, what's on your foot? You may need that reminder at some point to remember whose you are. Because a lot of other things will crowd in and suddenly you find yourself obeying them instead of him. And you can put it wherever you want. If you do put it on your forehead, <laughs> you gotta know it's gonna cause other problems and they may lock you up and you'll have a ministry in the place where they lock you up. <laughs> um, we need those reminders. We start with whose we are. And that'll help you define yourself. Will you pray with me? Father, we chase after so many things to make us feel 
whole, intact, good. And Lord, you've, you've explained to us over and over and over, there's one way. We were made for one person. And you've come to set that right so that we can have life in you to be who we were made to be. We only find that when we figure out who it is we belong to, who it is that sought us out to buy us, to redeem us, to free us. And God, our identity is not found in us trying to figure it all out. It's just found in you. And being able to realize who it is I belong to, whose son or daughter I am. And so God, I thank you for just short words at the beginnings of books of the Bible that help us to get anchored before we go further to realize this all starts with understanding who our maker is and that he wants us so bad that he died to buy us back. Thank you for that, Father. Thank you for Jesus. Jesus.